Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jesse Durham with your evening news. I regret to inform you today that the stock market has crashed. There have been runs on the bank with many calling for bankruptcy. World War I. World War II. There is conflict in Korea. War in Vietnam. Stagflation. The dollar plummeting in price. The dot-com bubble. The housing crisis. Global shutdowns and pandemic. Hello and welcome to the Durham Talents Channel. My name is Jesse Durham. Today's subject is going to be current events and what that has to do with the infinite banking concept. So in having some discussions in this past week, I already actually had an idea of covering this because in general, on our YouTube, on our podcast, we cover what the industry would call evergreen material. We discuss things that just are. We discuss natural laws. We discuss banking as a function. It just exists. And other things that they're not going anywhere. They'll be the same in the future, much like they've been in the past. And I understand you can bank with anything. You could bank with tobacco and rice and alcohol and gold. You can bank with many different things. And I do understand folks is thinking, even my own thinking, through study of history and in reading. And I always admired that R. Nelson Nash had a recommended reading section in his book where book after book after book. So I still haven't read all of them myself. And I feel like I'm a pretty prolific reader constantly. I have probably half a dozen books more uh, open on my desk right now that I'm making my way through these different subjects. But all that to say this, that I understand that we live in the here and now. But of course, I would remind us that one of Nash's key principles is thinking long range. But inherently, in considering far into the future as being necessary for practicing privatized banking successfully, I would also say that looking into the past behooves us so that we can learn from those lessons and not just be destined to repeat it, at least at the me and the you level. See, certainly there's always going to be this boom bust cycle while things are what they are, meaning Governments doing what governments do, uh, the Federal Reserve doing what the Federal Reserve does, banks being bailed out, etc. But at the me and the you level, which is the crux of Nash's work in his book, Becoming Your Own Bankers, just bringing banking back to the me and the you level. Sure, we look at current events from our perspective and they mean something to us and they're certainly purported to us. I mean, we're inundated with what's happening here and what's happening there. But again, I think it behooves us to look back in history. So in having conversations just this past week with individuals who were asking me questions about, well, Jesse, what do these current events, X, Y, or Z, mean for these insurance companies, for example, was one of the particular questions. And I just took a minute to talk about, quickly, in a very cursory way, though, but naming some key happenings over the past 100 years because I personally own policies with companies and more than one company. So I'm not married to any one particular company. You've heard me say before, I'm married to my wife, Lauren. I'm not married to an insurance company, but I own multiple policies with multiple companies that have paid dividends for well over 100 consecutive years. And if we just simply evaluate what has happened here in America, over the past 100 years, well, have there been global shutdowns and pandemics? Yes, and I'm not talking about any recent ones, although there have been those, and I received a dividend as well, mind you. But there have been world wars, World War One, World War Two. Both of those have happened in the past couple uh, or past past hundred years or so. Okay. There have been runs on banks. There have been recessions, depressions, inflation, stagflation. There's been the, the dot-com bubble, the housing crisis of 08, wars, conflicts. I mean, you name it, just look at history and just see what has happened. 
And then simultaneously, let's recognize that these insurance companies, those that have consecutively paid dividends for at least 100 years, have done so above and beyond meeting the guaranteed contractual rights necessary to provide death benefit for folks all along the way, access to cash values or policy loans all along the way, and those dividends. So if we're looking at, well, who's the most conservative, who's the most stable, who's got the biggest, deepest, broadest foundation of all the financial institutions out there, I'm just saying, James Nethery says it this way. He says he believes it's mutual life insurance companies against the world. And I pointed out in a recent podcast that it's not for just any reason that mutual life insurance companies exist because they can't be found just anywhere in the world either. But here in North America, they do exist. And here in the U.S., such companies have existed for well over 100 years, paid dividends for well over 100 years, met all of their contractual obligations to pay death benefits and and policy loans, policy withdrawals, everything that's been contractually guaranteed to policy owners and therefore part owners in these companies and including the dividend. So are current events important? Sure. To what extent? I don't know. Some, I'm not saying, but again, if we focus on the things that we can control, what Nash pointed out in his book is that the average American has abdicated the banking function. While, in fact, it is the most profitable thing that we could choose to do over the course of our lifetime. To be in the business of whatever we're in the business of. If you're an employee, if you're building a business, if you're an investor, if you're any mixture of these things, self-employed, it doesn't matter. Be in the business of financing that business. Be in the business of financing yourself. Don't abdicate the banking function to someone else. If you consider maintaining control over that banking function by properly structured whole life policies with mutual companies that pay dividends so that you can finance your lifestyle such as it is and then grow and scale that over the course of your lifetime to become 100% independent and autonomously free from being beholden to the conventional lending and banking system. When we look at what we can do, which is that, account for our need of finance and become our own bankers, I'm not saying that 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 does away with current events, that that does away with any of these other things, but what I'm saying is that, I mean, to be sure, I mean, my goodness, think about what it would take to pay for a war. And that has happened many times. And some folks did well during those times. Some folks did not. I would point out that regardless, if you're in a position of owning appreciating assets, wherein you can compound your cash flows, but you can also still access that capital. It's not locked away for the next 20, 30, 40 years, what have you. You can still access it. You can do so in a tax-free way and that ultimately also your heirs or beneficiaries would see a windfall of a tax-free sum. Well, with current events going on, and they've always been going on, they're always going to be gone, there's always going to be current events. Are we or are we not better off by practicing the infinite banking concept both for ourselves during our lifetime and for setting up what kind of a situation our children and grandchildren and beyond, however far you can wrap your mind around the future. You know, I was inspired several years ago by a gentleman that I'd heard for the first time. It's the first person that I ever heard in my life say something along the lines of think eight generations ahead which is really wild. And actually, now this is just coming to me. Uh, Yesterday, we were riding to to our church, and I was thinking about, okay, so for my son, I I need to take him and show him where his great, 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 five greats, 
grandfather has a tombstone just some miles from our house here. So again, several years ago, me hearing that gentleman saying, well, think eight generations into the future. For me at the time, that was that was a mind-opening experience and moment for me. I'd never done that before. I'd never heard anybody say that before. So all that again to say, however far we can think into the future, we we can recognize that, yes, things are going on now. Things will go on into the future. We have a track history that we can see with these mutual life insurance companies. I mean, life insurance predates our tax code here in the United States. The tax code began in 1913. And life insurance has been around for over 200 years. So we can look both ways is what I'm encouraging us to do. Yes, there are things that we can do, should do, need to do, um, have the opportunity to do right now. Read, learn, implement new actions that will improve our current events at whatever level we want to view current events here in my household, my business, okay, so it could be for you, your household, your business, your financial situation, into however far of a future you can wrap your mind around. But again, we've got a track record behind us in looking at these insurance companies. These po- And when you get a whole life policy, I mean, there are whole life policies that are 121 policies, meaning they got to age 121. That policy matures at 121. Whether you attain that age or you graduate before then, that policy is going to mature at 121. Now, that's long-range thinking. And that's right in line with what Nash would talk about when he would talk about thinking long-range, but also not being afraid to capitalize. How long would you like to capitalize a system that you own and control for whatever unknown future events that I don't know what they'll be like, you don't know what they'll be like. Sure, some things are going to repeat and, and rinse and recycle. But I don't know exactly what things are going to look like in the future. Nobody does. But if we could capitalize a system that we own and control, both for our future selves and, again, for future generations, I'm simply saying that's a great place to focus, even in the midst of current events such as they are. And that's actually a key point in in Nash's work when he would talk about the airplane example. He would talk about how an airplane does not fly through a vacuum. See, there's an environment. Okay, so I'm not trying to deny that there's an environment around us. And Nash pointed that out. You know, you could be facing a headwind in your airplane. You could be in the eye of a storm where, okay, you can make whatever headway you can make because you're not fighting a headwind. But you could also create a tailwind for yourself. And again, what he points out is this. If the average American's dealing with this headwind of indebtedness, interest dollars bleeding out to the third-party lenders, and someone here is practicing banking for themselves, I mean, well, not only are you moving faster than that airplane can, but they're going backwards, and you're just blowing past them exponentially faster forwards. So we operate in an environment. Financially speaking, we operate in an environment. So if you could control that environment, how much more profitable could you be? Come what may. Come what may, how much more profitable could you be if you account for the things that Nash points out that we need to account for, like Parkinson's law, Willie Sutton's law, the arrival syndrome, use it or lose it. The golden rule, all these different things that we need to consider that will impact our current events, certainly at the micro level, certainly at the one on one, the me and the you level. But could it impact future generations? Could it impact the churches, nonprofits that we care about, our communities? Absolutely. Absolutely, for sure it could. Now, some other things to consider in evaluating history and current events is to think of money itself, and plenty of people do. Who was it? Was it Oscar Wilde? Someone said, well, I'll have to cover that on our quote section where they said, the only people that think about money more than the rich are the poor. (laughs) I thought that was terribly interesting and well put. But if we were to consider money and its trajectory over time as well, 
what could a dollar buy you 50 years ago? Some of some of us know. What could a dollar buy five years ago? What may it buy five minutes into the future? Okay, so there's this trajectory that we've seen where the dollar has depreciated. Now, here I would point out, well, if you could take a depreciating dollars today and fund an appreciating asset that grows into the future, that's a great way to begin offsetting inflation for a start, to be sure, using depreciating dollars today for an appreciating asset that's going to continue to grow and compound into the future. That's a beautiful thing to consider. But also even consider what has money looked like before. Well, money before has looked like, here in the United States, tobacco has been accepted before. It's been an acceptable form of payment for taxes. There has been a time where that has happened. It's said that the Romans would pay salt to the legionnaires, to the soldiers, because of the value of salt. So once we realize that money is just a means of exchange, sure, currently the the U.S. dollar is uh, the world's note. That's what we're currently using, and we've been using it for some time now. But it's just a means of exchange. And that's changed over the course of time. But the utility of money, that means of of exchange, again, when it could be used in its depreciating form to procure appreciating assets. That's a beautiful thing. And if that form, if that medium changes, let's just recognize that unless everything comes crashing down, that when you own a policy, when you own a properly structured policy with a mutual company that pays a dividend, that is a legally binding unilateral Contract. Contract. So if that medium changes, okay, but that doesn't do away with that contract such as it is. And whether something else is substituted in the future, okay. But looking at the track record of money itself, considering the longevity of mutual life insurance companies, I'm just saying it's the most encouraging thing that I've found to date to counteract my thoughts or feelings or experiences about current events. It's a completely different situation of control and ownership, financial independence and autonomy, becoming your own banker. It's in the name. You could also consider inflation. I've I've done an episode on inflation, so if that's a subject that intrigues you, you can look up our episode there on, on just where I'm covering inflation in particular. But Again, once we recognize that inflation is not prices going up. Yes, we are seeing prices going up, but why do prices go up? It's a simple matter of supply and demand. Well, the amount of money in circulation has gone up. That's what inflation is. Is there being an inflated amount of money circulating? Well, our prices likely to go up in the future? That's a valid question. But ultimately, we should ask, who controls the banking function in our lives? Banking exists. It's always going to exist in a form. I mean, Jesus overthrew money changers' tables, okay? Um, He also told a parable where he talked about someone saying that, well, that money should have been taken to the lenders, to the bankers, so that I could have earned interest. So banking's always existed in a form. It will exist in a form. So who controls that function in your life? See, if we're influenced by the the current events that surround us, how much more important then and vital is it for us to consider controlling the banking function in our lives to maintain an acceptable level of financial autonomy and independence. And I have pointed out, just to give some examples in other episodes, but I'll mention them here too, you know, Disney and Pampered Chef and JCPenney, McDonald's, they were all starting and happening at at different points in history where there was some global conflict going on or there was a depression. So JCPenney, for example, JCPenney used cash values and policies that he owned during the Great Depression to cover his payroll. And of course, JCPenney's is 
what we what we know it as today. But imagine if he hadn't been able to weather that storm by being able to leverage cash values and policies that he owned. And there were other things that were happening in history during the time that Ray Kroc was starting up uh, the McDonald's chain, such as we know it, or that Miss Christopher was uh, taking loans from a policy that she had to start the Pamper Chef, her own her taking control of her own financial future to, and starting a business for herself that ultimately was bought by Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company. So there are some real life examples of folks. We can look at the insurance companies. We can look at history and everything that's occurred in whatever expanse of time that we're wanting to consider. But again, how much more control can we have over our financial well-being if we don't abdicate the banking function to someone else? We're subject to their scrutiny, their quali qualifications, their conditions and terms, paying interest out to them when we could be doing all that for ourselves. So it's been done before and we can do it again. It makes me think of actually some like world war cartoons we did it before and we can do it again yes we can do it again we did it before we'll do it again yeah my siblings are going to know exactly what i'm talking about when they listen to this we uh we send uh, quotes back and forth to each other and we and we quote uh the things that we heard and and whatnot growing up we have a good time you you probably let me know hey just put it down in the comment section do you do that with your siblings friends like you watch the same movies and you throw quotes, lines back and forth to each other. We do that all the time. It's it's virtually its own language. But let's get back on track here. We will always need a warehouse of wealth. Wealth must reside somewhere. It always has. Again, just that parable in, in, in Scripture that talks about, you know, well, wealth being buried in a hole in the ground. Is that is that the right place for it? Maybe, if you choose, sure, go ahead. Or is it doing this or that investment, business, opportunity? Maybe you decide that. My point is that in that parable, it says at least I should have been earning interest. Right. So the banking function. See, our capital has a cost to it. There's a cost of capital. You're not going somewhere and borrowing money for nothing capital has a cost and if you are the type cash is king and you're setting aside money great that's a great habit but if you're setting aside money you are losing you're missing out okay on the interest that you otherwise could have earned you otherwise could have been earning compound interest on your money by setting aside cash so i can say that our experience has been this right we've practiced this idea personally my my household for seven years now over the past seven years, you know, from the very beginning where we read Nash's book and saw a presentation was exposed to this idea of becoming your own banker and, and then buying our first policy. We've bought six policies over the past seven years. We'll continue to buy policies, properly structured, whole life policies with mutual companies that pay a dividend. And we've experienced different things. We've experienced career changes. You know, my wife coming home from full-time work and even part-time work to homeschool our children. we I've experienced career changes over the past seven years. We've taken family vacations. We've paid off a car. We've paid off student loans that we had from years ago that we're, we were dragging around like many are. I was talking on the phone with somebody just this past week about student loans and what that amount was and how... It, you know, it was bothersome to her how when you send a payment even, because there are all these different loans, it's only a little bit of money here going, a little bit of money there, a little bit of money, instead of being able to consult, just be able to knock one out, you know, with a punch. Anyway, these are things that we've done over the past seven years. There's been a lot going on. There, there has always been current events. There are current events, and there will always be current events. But what I'm saying is, by us assuming more and more and more of the responsibility and the opportunity of our banking, we've been better off because of it. Because 
we own those assets. We leverage those assets. We're compounding our money into the future. We're building up a legacy for our children's children's children eight generations down the road. And we're not done yet. I've not arrived. I've got so much more to do, so much more to learn, so much more to implement. But I do want to be an encouraging voice in so many different ways. Remember this, the time's going to go by anyway. Time marches on, they say. The time's going to go by anyway. What if, what if, current events be what they may, what if you controlled the banking function in your life? How much more security? I mean, need I say anything more other than the word guarantee? <laughs> okay, not everybody gets to use that word. Um, I do. Guaranteed death benefit. Guaranteed access to capital. Guaranteed compound growth. As, as much strength as the word guarantee can have in this life, I get to use it when talking about properly structured whole life policies with mutual companies that pay dividends. And we can look at that track record. So how much more profitable could you be? How much more control could you have? How much more security could you experience? How sure could you be of compound growth of your money? How certain could you be about maintaining an access, a contractual right to access your capital, not locking it away for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, exposing it to market volatility. Again, we talked about the Great Depression and the recessions that we've experienced and stagflation and inflation, all these different things. I mean, how much exposure do we want to market volatility? And I'm not making suggestions or recommendations there. I'm not giving advice there, rather. But you decide that for yourself. But again, if you'll account for the banking function in your life, It'll be the most profitable thing that you could choose to do. And I hope that this has been encouraging. I hope that this has been helpful. If you'd like to learn more about this subject, I encourage you to read Nash's book. I encourage you to dive in on our channel to subscribe. If you've if this is your first episode, welcome to the channel. If you're a recurring listener and haven't subscribed, love to hear you in the comment section the comment section. See, I'm gonna get a blooper now. You could put that down in the comment section uh, that you've subscribed. Love to have this shared with folks that you care about, that you feel could improve their situation, their current events by becoming their own banker and learning about this powerful financial information. And if you'd like to have a conversation directly with me about how to implement the infinite banking concept into your household or your business or your investing, then you can reach us at 828 817 4223. Or you can email for a free consultation, durhamtalents at gmail.com. This has been a great pleasure for me. I look forward to our next conversation. Have a great day. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our evening news. Thank you for joining. This just in nuclear crisis, stagflation, a plummeting U.S. dollar, the dot com bubble, the housing crisis. Pandemics, global shutdowns, recessions, depressions, stagflation, inflation. No, I'm not talking about current events. I'm talking about things that have happened up to 100 years ago. Let's go!